Good day, everybody. Uh, so my name is Annick Lapointe. I'm a general manager and the CEO of National Bank of Canada in the US. So I wanna, I wanna welcome you to this event, Pathway to the Board. Uh, the event will be for a total of one hour. Uh, so we'll have four, 35, 40 minutes of interview. And then I'll come back at the end uh, with uh, 15, 20 minutes of Q&A. So you can see at the bottom of your screen, you have a little place where you can see Q&A. Please don't wait at the end. Uh, as soon as you have questions for our guests, go ahead and at the end, I'll try to answer the more uh, of the question I can. So what a honor for me to introduce you who I can call my good friend, Phyllis. Uh, Phyllis Yaffe, uh, she was announced at Canada's Consul General in New York in 2016. And she served in that role up to the end of 2019. And this is when I have the privilege to meet Phyllis. Phyllis, she had a distinguished career in both the private and the nonprofit sectors. Mrs. Yaffe has served as chair of the board of Cineplex Entertainment. She was lead director of Torstar Corporation and, and a member of boards of Lion Gates Entertainment and Blue Ant Media. She's a former, a former board member of Astral Media and for many years, she served as senior officer and ultimately as chief executive officer of Alliance Communication Inc. So Ms. Yaffe, she's a recipient of the Order of Canada, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from Women in Film and Television. In 1999, she was selected as Canadian Woman in Communication, Woman of the Year. In 2006, she was included in the Women's Executive Network list of Canada's 100 Most Powerful Women. She was also inducted into Canadian Association Broadcaster Hall of Fame and has served as the Chair of Board of Governors of Ryerson University, Chair of Board of Women Against Multiple Sclerosis, Chair of the Ontario Science Centre, and served on the Board of the World Wildlife Fund. Ms. Yaffe holds a Master of Library Science from University of Toronto, a Bachelor of Library Science from University of Alberta and a Bachelor of Arts of University of Manitoba, as well as an honorary Doctor of Laws from University of Manitoba, honorary Doctor of Literature from Mont St. Vincent University and honorary Doctor of Laws from Ryerson University. So just taking it, reading this, that's, keep my, that's keeping my breath away. And by the way, I skipped a lot because I would have taken the full hour to go to her bio. <laughs> so uh, you will now have the privilege to listen to her and see how humble this woman is in spite of the amazing career she had. So this is one of the greatest leader I had the chance to meet in my career. And now my good friend, Caroline, who has more energy than me, okay? Who doesn't know Caroline, Caroline Kudzi? So she founded Women in Governance a decade ago. She received an award from her work on gender equality by UN Women. She was named among the top 100 most powerful women in Canada, the top 75 immigrants in Canada, and top 20 diversity figures in Quebec. Very recently, she was named among the top 100 entrepreneurs changing the world by FAMESA. She sits on several boards, so that's the topic uh, of today, uh, like Montreal Museum Fine Arts. She's on Alexa Trans uh, Translation. And just uh, this week, uh, she was appointed on the board of Quebec Employer of the Year. So Caroline, you have the mic, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Annick, uh, for this warm introduction. Uh, thank you also for all your tireless work supporting women in governance. You're heavily involved, you're very modest, but you're heavily involved uh, uh, within our mentoring program and uh, have always been a true supporter of our expansion into the United States. Uh, and actually, this is how I can talk very briefly of how I met 
Phyllis Yaffe, uh, our, our mutual friend, Catherine Huguet, who's the Delegate right. General yes. of Quebec uh, in New York, uh, introduced us. And um, I have to say that Phyllis, as Consul General, when I, when I first met her uh, in her very impressive uh, New York uh, office, uh, came across right away as a very warm, kind, genuine, interested person in, in all the work that we do at Women in Governance and wanting to support our expansion and, uh, and make sure that we're able to uh, have an impact in uh, corporate America as well. So Phyllis, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, for kindly uh, sharing your, your experience. The title, as Anik mentioned, of this uh, event is the Pathway to the Boardroom. Um, it's part of a workshop series that are dedicated to the women in our mentoring programs. We have two levels of mentoring programs. We have women at the professional level and we have women at the executive level who are mentees within our programs. And we are hoping to give them inspiration, tips and, uh, and ways of uh, getting, cracking their first uh, board or maybe getting uh, more uh, boards in their, um, on, on their CV and in their experience. So, um, Phyllis, you started as a librarian, and that's also the second title of this conference. How do you go from librarian to CEO of a publicly traded company? So I guess maybe we can start there. We can start with a quick um, overview of, of your career, and then we'll dive into the more... Um, more into everything that has to do with your board work. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And of course, it's terrific to be here with Anik because we did spend a lot of time together in New York. Um, I, uh, I know it's an odd path and people always wonder how you go from being a librarian and why I was a librarian, I guess. But I, for me, there was a, a thread that went through my career that made sense as I did it. Um, I stumbled into being a librarian, I will admit it. It is a long time ago, but it was the first thing I did out of university. And uh, I loved it. I absolutely adored it. I loved getting books to people. I loved talking about books with people. And that led me into the publishing industry, which led me into the not-for-profit not uh, trade association. Um, I guess people are wondering if there's feedback. Maybe we should put some uh, things on mute. There we go. I'll go, to, I'll go on mute for a little bit. Okay, doke. How's that? Better? I think that's better. So uh, I went from the, the, the library world to the publishing industry and from the publishing industry to the film and television industry and from that to... Uh, to running a broadcast group, and from that, uh, eventually becoming the CEO of Alliance Atlantis. I will say that when I look at it, it all made sense in a certain way, because the thing I, I liked about all those jobs is I got to promote the work of Canadian artists, Canadian creators, whether it was in books or, or, or television or uh, children's magazines. I worked at Owl and Chickadee magazines for a long time, or or just as it as as I evolved into the broadcast industry throughout and film. Um, Canadian writers, producers, actors. So the, it, there is a link, although I uh, I know that when you look at it all, it does seem a little strange. But but I think it's not unlike a lot of people's careers. You go from one thing to another because it makes sense. It makes sense at the time. And, and so then what led you to move on from librarian? Well, I went from uh, a, a, the library world. Um, you know, the, I will say I, uh, my friends and I started a magazine in the, in the early 70s. So this is uh, ancient history, but we started a magazine for librarians, feminist librarians in Canada. It was called Emergency librarian. So when you think of librarians, I know everybody will tell me they can't think of an emergency, but when you realize that getting information to people was hard, there was no internet, there were no cell phones. People, when people wanted the answer to a question, they would phone the library and we were the answers. 
We were the internet of those days. And so we felt that there was a role to play of getting information to people that created uh, an open and democratic society. And to be fair, um, I think that's accurate about how library, the role libraries played and still play for many people. And so we thought as feminists, as librarians, we needed to come together in Canada and have the conversation about the role we played. And that led me to the publishing industry and that led me to where I am today. So the last, so when we talk about CEO of a publicly traded company, it's uh, Alliance, Alliance Atlantis. Uh, you have uh, had several roles, I believe, at uh, that company. How did your career progress within Alliance Atlantis? You know, uh, it is, I am sort of the, uh, the poster child for um, it doesn't always go the same way. Um, so I, I applied with uh, the company Alliance before Alliance Atlantis to um, uh, maybe mute while you're at it, Carolyn, uh, to um, uh, the CRTC. As we all know, you have to go in Canada. There's a process to get a license for a for a television network. So I applied to the CRTC with Alliance for a, a channel in 1994 and we got a license and it was uh, for a channel I hope people still know and love called Showcase. We started and it went on the air in 1995 and then we applied for the History Channel which started in 96. And in 98, Alliance and Atlantis merged and because I was on the side that got merged into the company, it was very unlikely that I would stay around. Um, the other team had broadcasts and they had an equivalent position. So I went to see a lawyer and he said, 99.999% of the time you're leaving. And so um, I got ready to think about what I would do next, but it took a year for the CRTC to decide to let us merge because the process is long and important. And by the time the year was over, they asked if I would stay and run the broadcast group for both com the merged company, which I did. Um, and that led to running many more channels. By the time 2002 arrived, uh, we probably had 13 or 14 different channels on the air. And then um, uh, they asked me to become COO of the company. And I think 2003, which I did for a couple of years. And then Michael McMillan, who was the CEO said, he wanted to become executive chair of the company and I would become the CEO. And I said to him, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, you're, I'm older than you. <laughs> you should stay and do all this hard work. But he, he said, no, that was the right choice. The board agreed. And so I became CEO in 2005. And um, I, uh, I can never ever um, uh, recognize him enough for seeing that he wanted to do something different and he wanted me to do the job that he hadn't done for so long, but also I loved, I just loved being in that business and I thrived. And of course we sold the company in 2008 and uh, I went on to go on to a lot of boards after that. But while I was at Alliance Atlantis, I was on a couple of boards that we had internally, of course our own board, but also our film distribution board and others. And I got a lot of um, opportunity to see firsthand how a board worked. Well, that speaks volumes of how people were considering you so that you're able to be the one that's chosen, the one who stays and the one who uh, moves up so, uh, so brilliantly. Um, so because of this uh, feedback uh, echo issue, I will maybe ask you a couple of questions and then mute myself and then you can answer them. Uh, sure. I really want to get into the board work and, um, and all the different uh, roles that you've played on boards, sitting on boards, chairing boards, etc. Some for profit, some nonprofit, etc. Um, so, if you could talk to us about first of all, how do you crack your first board? What does it mean to sit on a board briefly? You know, like high level. Uh, there are women who want to sit on a board, but they've never had that experience. So it's not really clear to them what is your role, your responsibility, and uh, maybe what is needed in terms of education, of career advancement, of network. 
to actually be able to, uh, to accomplish that. And maybe it touch on the due diligence that you need to do before you, uh, right. I think it's an important point. Over yeah. to you. First. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. I, you know, I, uh, I think the first board I went on to at the beginning, uh, when after we sold the company was um, uh, probably on um, Torstar and Cineplex, probably around the same time. I knew the people, I'd worked with the people at Cineplex, they were on our board, so uh, at Alliance Atlantis, so I knew them well, and it was an industry I was very heavily involved in, and it made sense. So I went on to that board uh, and, and very quickly became the chair of the board. Um, at Torstar, I, it wasn't an industry I knew as well, although I certainly knew journalism from my background in, in uh, media. Um, but it is a, it's a different kind of, it was a different kind of company. It was, it was publicly traded at the time and it was also family controlled. So it's very different structure and they, de they did need an independent lead director, somebody who would take the role of, of sort of speaking for the shareholder rather than the, the families that control the votes. And they asked me to be lead director. So I really, took, uh, you know, I, I, I became part of the um, sort of the small group of people who really paid attention to how the governance of that company ran. Because uh, in a family owned company or controlled company, even if it's publicly traded, often the, the votes are not equal. And so people need to make sure that if you're a shareholder, you are being given fair treatment. So those two experiences were very important to me, very demanding in my time and my, my energy, but I learned a lot and um, I was delighted to be able to do it. Did it for a long time on both those boards. Lionsgate was a business that had been uh, Canadian and was Canadian um, domiciled. They needed Canadian directors, although they are in California. And of course, because I've been in the film and television business, they asked me to join that made a lot of sense. It was a terrific experience. Um, and Blue Ant Media is uh, a company uh, started by Michael McMillan, who was my former CEO at Alliance Atlantis. So we had a lot in common and he asked me to join that board. And Astral, of course, I'd worked with very closely over the years, we were partners with them. I knew Ian Greenberg well from my time uh, in the media business and I was happy to join. So they were all kind of people I knew reasons that made sense. My background and their business made sense. I will say that at Lionsgate, and I think this is not unusual, I think I was the only person on the board who had any experience in the industry. There were lots of financial people. There were lots of people who were connected to the, to the management team, but there was nobody who actually had been in the business. And by the way, there were no other women. So it was, uh, it was an unusual experience. But being from the industry was not that common in the boards I was on. And that is, a, and people think that's strange. Um, I think it's still pretty common that boards are made up of people who are mostly in finance, mostly from the financial world or the legal world, and not often from the actual industry that you know the the business operates in and that that is kind of an interesting way of thinking of where you want to be when you want to be on a board do you want to be on a board where you know the industry or you learn the industry so my criteria for being on a board are i have to learn something from the business or i i don't want to do it i have to be interested in the business and want to learn about it i have to want to spend a lot of time in that world because you do spend a lot of time, a lot of time working on it, reading. Uh, I also want to know that uh, I like the people. And that for me is absolutely essential because you will spend a lot of time with them. So knowing the people involved, knowing the management team, understanding the industry, wanting to learn, those are all criteria I use when I decide to go on a board.
And so in other words, when there are boards that are all male and they're telling us that they can't find a woman in their industry, uh, they're not really being uh, very, first of all, they'll find the women if they really have to. And, and second of all, that's definitely something I always tell boards when they say to me, well, we're in the engineering field, it's hard, there are not that many uh, graduates in engineering. Well, uh, you don't really need that. You actually need people who come from all walks of life and can actually bring a fresh perspective and, uh, and, and different points of view around the boardroom table. So that encompasses obviously genders, women, men, but also different generations, also different origins. Um, sexual orientation, uh, religious beliefs, et, et cetera, to, to reflect society as a whole. Now, Phyllis, can you tell us about your nonprofit boards and if you think this is maybe a good place to start when you want to sit on boards? Sure. Let me just say that to the, to the point that, you know, when companies say they can't find somebody with their own background, they all have human resources departments. They all have communications departments. They all have media. Uh, they all have... Uh, uh, financial departments, they all have legal departments, all of those fields um, would make for great candidates. So I never ever accept that reason that they are, haven't worked in my industry. You want to learn something when you get on a board. So that that doesn't, it doesn't pass muster if you ask me. I, I did, I, I have always paid attention to the not-for-profit world. I worked in it for a long time as well. Um, you know, my first board, I was thinking about it today, was actually at the Ontario Science Centre. Um, and uh, it is a wonderful institution. In 1991, the government of Ontario asked me uh, to chair the board of the Ontario Science Centre. I'd never been on any boards at the time. Uh, and, and of course, that seems ridiculously lucky and wonderful. How did it happen? I, I had I had worked in, the, I was working in the publishing industry. I was uh, working in the publishing association uh, for Ontario. I met with the minister to talk about publishing in Ontario. I got to know her. She had to appoint someone to the science center board. And by knowing her and getting to know the people around her, I, they decided to ask me to do that. And I, I remember walking into that board. It was not for profit. It was complicated. Um, there were a lot of people on the board, all appointed by the government, and I knew none of them. I knew I'd never been on that board, and I walked in as their chair. Very daunting. Um, but you know what? Uh, I spent six years doing it. I loved it. I got to know the place very, very well. We had lots of issues, as every institution did, but it taught me about finding a way to bring people together on a not-for-profit board because the mission is what drives you to be on that board. And it's the mission of any not-for-profit that should drive you to be on it. So when it became, when uh, uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Society was starting Women Against MS, uh, my husband had MS and I was, ex obviously it was near and dear to my heart and that made sense for me to do that. Um, the uh, World Wildlife Fund, um, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I think everybody has a sense of where we're going with the world of the environment, but, but what I liked about that organization was it's science-based, it's, its integrity is, is its goal, uh, you know, it needs, it, it works on it from a, a base of fact and information, and I, I thought that was where I wanted to spend my energy. So I, and by the way, getting on the World Wildlife Fund board allowed me to meet people who eventually asked me to go to New York. So it's a, it's, it's a conversation, it's a circle that, a virtuous circle. And that's actually exactly where I wanted to take you when you started talking about WWF. Um, what is the role of networking uh, in a woman's career? Can you talk about that and how you were approached for a role that actually you probably had in mind for the past 15 years since your friend uh, uh, Pam uh, Wallen uh, had uh, played the role uh, 15 years earlier, I believe. It's, uh, it's my favorite story to tell because I always thought the cultural ambassador, I know I, I think Quebec has it, Ontario had one, I don't know if they still do, but they had a cultural ambassador to uh, France. And I thought, oh my God, what a wonderful thing to do. But I, I mean, for me, New York was a lot more 
legitimate, I mean, language, culture, I don't know, it just made sense. So when my friend Pam Wallen, who is now a senator, but uh, then was a broadcaster, was asked to go to uh, New York and become the consul general in New York for Canada, there was a goodbye party for her. And I went to the party and I signed into the book to say goodbye. And I wrote, do a good job because I want it next. And then 15 or 16 years later, I did do it. There were several people in between, but I guess it was always in the back of my mind. I always thought it was a wonderful thing to do. And it was, by the way, a, a dream come true. It was a wonderful position. I loved every minute of it. But um, I will say that knowing the people I met at World Wildlife Fund allowed me to be asked to do that job. And so uh, and also Toy Star, I should say. Those people were very instrumental in saying, you know, would you like to do this? And so I guess I would say networking, you know, networking in life is a good thing to do, but we used to just call it making friends. Now we call it networking. Um, and it, and it's perfectly, uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly good mechanism to find other positions and get on boards, but it's also a way what, what I say to people when they say, how, how can I get on my first board is, is you have to get recognized. You have to stand out from the crowd because the, everybody on this call, I bet, would like to be on a board. So how are you going to make the difference for you? You're going to stand out by doing things that make people know you, get to know people who are going to make decisions. And I, I think the worst thing people can do is is do it in a formulaic word way. It isn't, it isn't, you know, take one step, do the next. It's getting to know people in a human, compelling, honest way and talking to them about the things that matter to you. And can you tell us about the importance of mentoring in a situation like this when you're reflecting on your next steps or you've got a clear objective, et cetera. Because we've got a lot of uh, our mentors and mentees uh, uh, in the workshop today and they will get to do breakout rooms when, when we're done as well and, right. and reflect and discuss some of the things that we've, uh, we're talking about now. Um, did you have a mentor? Did you find that helpful? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I wouldn't say I had a mentor. Um, I certainly had people who, uh, you know, more in the role of a sponsor. And, and I know that's a, a, a newer, you know, way of looking at it. But um, one of the lawyers who was very instrumental in getting uh, the showcase license at the CRTC, Peter Grant, was uh, a longtime friend and colleague in the publishing world. And he was always looking out for me. I would phone him and say, I think I need to make a change. What do you think? Or when positions came up, I would talk to him about it. And when it was time to apply for the license for showcase, he, uh, he recommended me to Alliance. And then, you know, we always, he, he was always thinking uh, what would be good for me at certain points in my career. So I, I would say rather than a mentor, he was a sponsor. And I think there is a difference. There's an active role there. Um, but I mean, I understand the role of mentoring. I, I guess I would say I've always done it in a very informal way. I've always left the door open uh, in whatever position I was in for people that I worked with to come and talk to me, ask me about their futures. I still have lots of those conversations today um, and I'm very happy to do it. it. It's, I can see how important it is, especially if you feel uh, that it's hard to make yourself known. A mentor can really help, I think. And can we go back for a minute in terms of the due diligence? So let's say I'm a woman who doesn't sit on any board at this point, and I would like to get my profile out there. So how do I sort of get my branding going? How do I let people know that I'm interested and uh, if somebody does tap me on my shoulder, uh, how do I actually do my, my due diligence and ensure this is the right organization that I want to associate myself with and uh, give my time? Yeah, it's very important to do that due diligence. How, how you make yourself known, I, I think I go back to the notion of 
of finding people you uh, who you think will be your mentor or your sponsor who will speak on your behalf who but but standing out from the crowd means doing extra making yourself known working very hard i mean i used to say have a good life you know do a really good job at what you do and people will notice you and i guess that sounds you know most people would say but i do a really good job and still it's hard and i i know that it's harder now than when i did it for sure but i think it it is the fundamental if you're really well if you're if you're performing very well people will notice um i guess the the diligence part to me is so essential because i always say to people it's harder to get off a board than to get on because once you're on it will always look bad if somebody leaves in a hurry so please please do the due diligence ask around talk to people who know the organization read their material go online uh, meet with some of the other directors get to know the people make sure that the workload is what they say it is you know uh, i know a lot of people think of being on a board as a way of uh, i don't know getting um, a, a whole other um, income stream and of course you know in a in a a, a for-profit company eventually it can be but it takes a long long time to get there so don't think of it as a replacement for your job think of it as as something that supplements it but takes a long time to get there but don't don't do uh don't leap take very careful steps is what i would say All wonderful points. I just want to briefly, before I pass the baton to my friend Anik for the Q&A period uh, from the audience, I just want to briefly share uh, my own experience on the boards that I'm on uh, today. Well, the most recent one is the uh, Quebec Employers Council, the Conseil du Patronat du Québec. Uh, that nomination is so fresh that this is the first time that I'm speaking about it. Uh, I'll be announcing it uh, a little bit later uh, this week or next. And uh, um, so in terms of my due diligence, I was approached by their CEO, Carl Blackburn, who said, you know, we think you would be a great addition to the board. Uh, there's uh, uh, some board directors who are leaving soon and, and we'd like you to, to join. So first things first is, okay, in terms of time, do I have the time to do this? Well, the answer almost always is I don't really have the time. But can I make the time? Right. Uh, is this something that matters enough for me? So what is the goal of that board? What are they working on? Is there a parallel with the work that I'm doing in women in governance? Can that, in, in, in a way, can, can they feed off each other? And the answer was yes. Then I went on the website to look at who the board members are. Can I associate myself with these people? Is the organization... Uh, well established, is it credible? And obviously, when it comes to the Conseil du Patronat, uh, it's been around for more than 50 years, extremely well regarded, very credible, very respected by the Quebec government. And when I looked at the, um, the board directors, so unlike you, who were the only woman, I was very relieved to see, to see that there was uh, Perry, nine women out of 21 board members, a very decent uh, uh, number of women, right. obviously. Um, and then when I looked, I knew most of them. And that also reassured me that, okay, my network is embracing this organization. And then I sent emails to these people and very openly told the CEO uh, that I was going to do that. I said, listen, let me just check. And then I had some phone calls with these people who all encouraged me, told me about the work that they're working on, how exciting it is, how, how uh, helpful it would be for, for them to, to have me on board, etc. And I decided to, uh, to, to join. Um, when it comes to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the image that you see behind me, that was a totally different uh, a story and it was very much covered by, by media. So I'm not going to get too much into that, but just to say that you can also do a campaign to get yourself elected on a board. Uh, it's very much like a, almost a political campaign where you've got people behind you who are supporting your candidacy, who are putting together some communications, uh, key messages that you're getting out there. And when there's usually 50 people who show up at the annual General Assembly of the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal, um, this time there was 1,380 who came because uh, uh, myself and three other amazing women decided to have a, a, 
the four women uh, candidates uh, slate and uh, presented ourselves. So, and that worked out uh, wonderfully well because three out of us four uh, made it to, to that board. And the other one, uh, which is a for-profit organization, Alexa Translations, um, that's through networking. Somebody who came to uh, one of our galas at Women in Governance was very impressed with, with the work that we did and, um, and invited me again, same thing. I looked at the uh, uh, board directors parity, half women, half men, and most of these people, uh, high uh, level executives from top corporations, that also reassured me that they've done their due diligence before right. me and then speaking to them. So, um, voila, I don't want to take up too much time uh, from uh, Anik, who I'm going to invite to come on, uh, on, on camera to get questions from the audience. I am sure that there are a lot of very pertinent uh, questions and comments that you'd like to share with Phyllis. So Anik, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I will let the two of you have these discussions and I will come back for our conclusion remarks. Hey, merci Caro. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, uh, Caroline told me, oh, I'll prepare a few questions and uh, just in case there's not gonna be uh, enough. Oh my gosh, there's gonna be enough. So uh, for everybody, if we don't have uh, the time to go through all the questions, I'll make sure I'm gonna submit them to Phyllis. If sure. she can respond to them after, that would be, uh, that would be awesome. So Phyllis, uh, one question that it's a side, I have two questions a little bit aside of the, uh, the board. So what was your largest challenge going from a CEO position to a CEO position? Well, I, I mean, they are very different positions. So I was, uh... COO with my colleague Michael being the CEO and he was the founder of the company so there was a vision that he had um, and he played the leadership role in the company overall and I was very much involved in the day-to-day -day of making sure that all the parts were moving in the right direction but when you become CEO you realize as I said in many times you are the face of the company to the world and you you have to remind yourself at every occasion you speak publicly on behalf of the company. And so I really had to change my role from being an internal role to being an external role. I would do the, the conference calls with uh, the analysts on a quarterly basis, uh, a lot of fun. I hated that part, but I did it. Um, I would do the uh, public speaking on behalf of the company, but, but you know, setting the tone for the whole company was really a major part of what the CEO does. And so you really become the embodiment of the, of the company to the rest of the world. And so it's a very different role. Um, I guess I had led other organizations, so it wasn't, it wasn't impossible for me, but it was a big challenge. I, I, uh, but I, you know, I made a deal with my colleague, Michael, that he would, he became chair, uh, executive chair. And I said, you can't leave. So we never really parted company. We just made a different team. Thank you, Phyllis. Another question that I have uh, more general and that's coming, Catherine Nubier is listening to us. Ah, okay. Hi, Catherine. She's saying hello to you, our good <laughs> friend from uh, the Delegate General in Quebec. So Catherine was asking, I feel like women are not as good as men to take credit for their achievement when we have senior position. Do you agree on that? And what would be your advice? I mean, this is a long, you know, this is, this is a cultural question that I think is so true and so relevant. You know, even if we think about the times when people have asked you to do something, and as a woman, you've stepped back and said, well, let me think about it. I'm going to go home and talk to my family. I don't know if I can. We all know that 99% of the men who'd be asked for the same question would just say yes. Just say yes. You know, they may not be skilled enough to do it, but they, they assume they'll learn how to do it or they'll figure it out. And we take more time. We ask ourselves more questions. I think that is a cultural, historical kind of response. But I think it's changing. I think women are now learning that we have to take credit for what we've done, stand up for ourselves, think positively. To be fair, you know, we cannot... And we have not balanced the childcare family responsibilities. It is not 50-50 in anybody's home. I don't know who right. thinks it is, but it isn't. 
even when they have the most supportive, helpful spouse in the world, uh, women take on more of that responsibility. And so, you know, it is more difficult to make the leap, but I think we are starting to be in a position where more and more women are saying, I have to do it. I have to take that chance. I hope, um, you know, uh, there are more, for instance, headhunters looking now for more women to be on boards. There are more processes. There are more places to go that are more formal where I think your, your, your CV, your, your past, your accomplishments will be taken into account. So I think, I hope that it's changing, but I think Catherine is right. At least she was right. I think we're a little frozen here. Oops, there you are. Kind of on mute. I'm okay. You hear yeah. me? Yeah. Now I can. Okay. So sorry. No, it's okay. The uh... it's the internet. I lost you again. Are you Anik? Uh, are you back? I'm here. Do you hear me? Oh, now, yes. Are, do you hear her, Phyllis? Yes? Yes, okay. I do. I, do. Right I, couldn't, I couldn't hear Phyllis, but I was hearing the rest. So hopefully now it's going to work now. Yeah, it's it, fine. Okay, very, okay. very good. Okay, thank you. So thank you for that, Phyllis. Another question that... Uh, we lost you. The first board role was uh, attained to exist as existing relationship, Okay. If you don't have strong relationship like that, what can you do? Uh, because if you want to go to these level, to the board level. Well, I mean, lots of people would take the road, route of, of taking the courses. There are many courses out there. The uh, Institute of Corporate Directors runs courses. Universities run courses. So get some uh, credentials is one of the answers I think people can use. And it is a very successful route to meeting other people, all of whom are interested in being on boards and have connections of their own. But I guess the, the you know, uh, the, the point I made earlier is try to find a way to stand out in your industry, in your business, in your organization, uh, go on committees, make yourself known to the people above and, uh, and in important positions, take on more responsibility as much as that's daunting uh, for the busy lives of young women with careers and families, it's important to get yourself known. So, um, you know, there is no simple thing to do. There is no number to call, but there is, uh, you know, the most important thing is get to know people and, and spend time proving that you have the skills to be on a board. Okay, so um, since Anik seems to be frozen again, I guess, um, let me try to see if I can get some of the questions in the chat. I did see questions coming in. Um, or let me think of one of my own um, instead of, of, of looking through my uh, through my emails. Um, so I'd like to know what's your next step. What, what are you uh, working on now, and what uh, animates you? Yeah, you know, I uh, I'm uh, I, I describe myself as a person who volunteered for the two hardest things in the pandemic. So I am back being the chair of Cineplex, and as you everybody knows, our business has suffered uh, through this last year terribly, but we're starting to see theaters open. I know in Quebec, they're opening this weekend and there are many other places where they are. So we hope everybody on the call who can will go to a movie soon. Um, and uh, I am on the board of Blue Ant uh, and I chair their uh, human resources committee, which I find interesting. And of course, I work closely with those people. Um, and I have agreed to become, I'm now the vice chair, but I will be the chair, I think, of uh, uh, an organization in Toronto called Baycrest, which is a, a uh, retirement long-term uh, long care assisted living facility 
So uh, with 1,100 beds uh, in the facility, it's a very impressive, wonderful place. So I have long-term care and movies, kind of the pandemic duo of uh, hard to manage places. But you know what? I, I, um, I'm a delighted grandmother of two wonderful grandchildren and uh, I have great friendships and family to spend time with. So the balance is really important. And so these are hard and complicated places to spend my time, but, but I think, you know, as much as they are wonderful for me, they're also a place I can give something back to a world that has been incredibly generous to me and given me a great and wonderful career. So I'm sorry about that. And I hope you can hear me now. Uh, I'm gonna try to shut down my video because I don't know what's going on, but uh, it's cutting all the time. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, hear you well. Yeah, thank you. So I'll leave it like that for now, Phyllis. Sure. Many, many of the questions that are coming back right now, it's give us really specific example of some of the responsibility that we have. And they want to know details of really when you're on the board, what yes. do you do? What? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a very good question. It's the question I think if you haven't been on a board, you should be asking yourself, am I ready to do those tasks? What are they? What are the responsibilities? And I think just paying attention, learning more about how boards work would be a really good first step. But I, you know, the, the first thing to say is, of course, reading everything that is sent to you is essential. And that gives you a sense of what the business is, is doing or the organization. And uh, um, as the meetings occur and the materials for the meetings come, there's a very serious amount of work to be done uh, paying attention to all of that till you get a familiarity with everything and it becomes easier to understand the language and the, the shorthand of the business. But then, uh, you know, your job is to advise, your job is to work with the management team important to remember that you aren't the management team. It's not your job to pick up the pieces and make them fit together. It's your job to, um, to advise, to, to set policy. And in, in a corporation, the board is really responsible for hiring and sadly, sometimes firing the CEO. And that is a very major responsibility because companies are driven by a CEO. So paying attention to the performance of the major players inside the company is hugely important. And, and besides that, there is a, a governance committee. So paying attention to the governance of the organization, are, is it being managed well? Is it being governed well? And then compensation. So understanding how the compensation of the people uh, running the organization works and how it fits in a very, difficult times such as now, making hard decisions about that, those are responsibilities you have. But governance, uh, dealing with the hiring and firing of the CEO and uh, setting policies like conflict of interest policies, those kinds of things, they're the primary responsibility and knowing when to keep your nose out of the business, knowing when to draw the line between being a board member and being an employee. That's a very tough one, but we all have to learn it. You're correct, Phyllis, and that's that's a huge difference between the two roles. Uh, Phyllis, uh, one of the questions I have there, and I could answer that for you because you're helping me so much as a mentor, <laughs> but what made you a good mentor and what, <laughs> what's your best approach? You know, I, I just think that I, I, I try to listen to what people are, the issues people bring. Um, and everybody's life is different and complicated and nobody has all the answers. I think that's the most important thing to say. I don't know how to solve everybody's problems, but I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to try to be helpful. And, you know, my rule at, at in all of my positions was if you call and say, you want to come and talk to me, I will always say, I can give you a half hour of my life. It will never make a difference in how much I get done in my life. And maybe it'll be helpful to you. I will always say yes. And I think that sort of just says, I, I'll do my best. I'll give you half an hour. I will hope to be able to send you to others who might be able to help you more as well. If I can't, I'll be honest, but I will 
do my best. And if you take that as a, a fair exchange, uh, I think that's a way to get started. But I'm always, I'm always, I try to be honest and say, I'm not going to be able to, uh, I'm not going to be able to solve the problem. I may give you my advice, but don't, don't assume that I'm going to come to you and give you the answers. I'll just try to be helpful and ask the right questions. And you're excellent as that, uh, Phyllis. Uh, I can uh, I can tell you from my own experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question that comes: it, There's a lot of people or a nonprofit uh, board at this moment, right. and even though they have a lot of experience in, in these nonprofit board, they cannot kind of achieve the le next level. And a lot of time they're saying, "Well, you're not in the C, C suite, so yeah, forget it for now." So what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think, I hope that's changing. And I, I, am, I am feeling more positive about it changing just because ESG, you know, uh, uh, it has become a more used term uh, um, because just being uh, interested in diversity has changed in our, in our corporate world so much uh, over the last year or two that I think that there are more companies looking to provide good governance and with it there there is the understanding that there has to be diversity on the board diversity of opinions diversity of backgrounds diversity of genders diversity of race it, all of that has become so important now and focused on so I think that there's a, 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 a opening door that that I hope will provide people with more opportunities but I think the the reality is and I've said this forever, people used to come to me and say, how did you go from the not-for-profit world to working in a for-profit company? And I always said, you know, it's harder to be in the not-for-profit world. You can't borrow money. You can't go to the bank. They won't lend not-for-profits money, but they will to corporations. So living on your cash is not a pro is not the same for not-for-profits as it is for profit-driven pro profit companies. And not-for-profits, you know, they're driven by a mission, but they have to live within a budget. They have to earn their revenue. They have to behave responsibly. It isn't so different. And so I think making it clear to people that the worlds are not as different as everybody likes to think they are. Uh, there are large and, and very uh, complicated not-for-profit organizations, and there are tiny ones, but the same can be said of the business world as well. So I, I hope the world is paying more attention to diversity and governance, and I hope that that is leading to opening that door uh, more to make the move between not-for-profits and for-profit. Thank you for this, and I'll take a last uh, question because uh, Caroline's gonna, uh, gonna need to, to close the, the, the event after. So my last question, Phil, is that we're receiving a lot in the chat. <clears throat> it's what's your position about, you know, the number now on the, the on the C, on the, all of the board, we're asking for a total of women, you know, what's your position on forcing an amount like that on a woman on these, uh, on these boards? I'm very glad that got asked because, uh, I used to be lonely as answering this question because my I learned long, long ago from a friend in, in the United States that, you know, when they made laws about uh, uh, employing people of color in the United States, they, they started by making it general, they started by asking, then the federal government of the United States said, we won't give you any business unless you have, uh, and when they set a limit, a, a quota for people of color. And all of a sudden, all the companies found a way to employ people of color. And I guess what I would say is quotas are not a bad word. It's not a bad idea. It's not a bad, it makes people listen. It makes people change their behavior. And, you know, we have had uh, comply or explain policies that have not moved things fast enough. We have, I always said it's so glacial, the, the, pro, the time of, of uh, uh, improving women on boards that I'll be long, hundreds of years will pass before we get to equity. So I have always been from the very, very long time ago, a supporter of quotas. And you know, people then say, well, I don't wanna be a woman who's appointed just because of a, a rule. And I say, well, men have been appointed that way all along. 
What, why would women not want that? You will prove to them that you are great at what you do the minute you get there. So take the position, enjoy it, use it, promote other women. Don't let, a, don't let an arbitrary number be your limit. Let it be the floor. Work hard to get more women on the board. You know, I, I think the days of being nice about this are over. We have to make progress and progress comes with being forceful and women have to be more forceful now. So I, I believe in quotas. I've said it to, I've said it to every level of government I ever came in contact with and I always will. That's how we'll make change fast. Thank you very, very much, Phyllis. Always a pleasure to hear you. Uh, so Caroline, you had the, the last words. Well, thank you so much, Annick. It was really wonderful to hear all those great questions from, uh, from the public. Thank you, Phyllis, for your comments also about quotas, because that'll give me an opportunity to plug the quote that I always use, which is, uh, when you legislate, you find the women. When you don't legislate, you find excuses. And I've been working on the, uh, on the question surrounding quotas and uh, and, and objectives that companies can also self-impose. Uh, um, uh, for, for many, many years, I've worked with uh, Marie-Jose Zimmermann, who's the deputy in France, who wrote the Quotas Law, uh, called Copé Zimmermann. Uh, they now have 42% uh, of women on boards uh, in France, which is double of what we have in Canada. So that's another proof. And uh, last month on January 27th was the 10th anniversary of this law. And we had Marie-Jose Zimmermann herself as a guest uh, uh, here uh, at Women in Governance in a fireside chat also including uh, Jean Charest, our firm, former premier of Quebec, who right. legislated uh, for Crown Corporations in Quebec. So all our, uh, our, our um, Crown Corps here, uh, Hydro-Quebec, Little Quebec, uh, our liquors board, et cetera, have 50% of, uh, of women on their board. So very obvious that it does work. The other thing that does work is uh, setting quotas, targets, objectives, and companies don't do that enough. If we compare ourselves to Australia, for instance, 80% of companies do that over there. In Canada, it's around 12%. So we have to do a lot more work on setting uh, clear objectives and for women and, and diversity um, in general. Um, which leads me to... Um, our, our, uh, our next event, which will take place on um, March 18th. If anybody's interested, uh, we'll share all the information for people who are listening today and who are maybe not uh, members or don't have our newsletter regularly, go on our website, register for the newsletter. You'll be the first to get all the information. So March 18th, we're organizing an event with the BC HR Association, where we're going to be talking about our parity certification which is uh, going into its fifth year already, which is uh, you um, are well aware, we've built with the pro bono support of McKinsey and Company. We're now supported by Mercer, Willis Towers Watson and Accenture uh, to do the evaluation of these progressive organizations that are looking to close the gender, uh, gender gap. So March 18th, this event is going to be very useful for any organization that might be interested to enroll in, in the parity certification and, and learn more. Um, after that, the following event will be on April 20th, and that's going to be our annual recognition gala. It is, uh, as usual, co-chaired by a man and a woman who lead uh, parity certified organizations. And so this year, it's Marc Parent, the uh, CEO of CAE. And the wonderful female co-chair uh, is Maria de la Posta, who's the president of Pratt & Whitney Canada, a very male-dominated uh, industry. So we're very delighted to, to have her. And um, our May event is going to be on May 20th with Catherine Tate, the first female CEO of the CBC, Radio-Canada. Um, and um, she will be talking about uh, all the things that CBC does to close the gender gap in the workplace. They are platinum certified uh, at Women in Governance. Um, I think that kind of concludes the events that are coming up. I encourage anybody on the call who's not enrolled in our mentoring program and is interested to look at uh, our website under the mentoring tab. 
Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank very warmly the co-chairs of that committee, Frank Bernard, who's a male champion who's been uh, working relentlessly in, uh, in supporting women uh, to develop their, their careers. Lorcoren Van Delft, who's also co-chaired for many years with Frank and will be uh, moderating the breakout rooms that are reserved for our uh, mentors and mentees right after we're done and their co-chair, Guylaine Vogel. Um, also want to remind everyone who speaks French that we've got governance training programs. Uh, we haven't translated them into English yet, but that's in the works. Uh, so anybody who's interested to sit on a board wants more uh, in-depth knowledge uh, of how you sit on a board, how you chair a board, and all the different um, uh, aspects of, uh, of board work uh, are, are shared uh, in that. So voila, without further ado, I uh, will let uh, Lorquen Van Delft uh, take over for the breakout rooms. I want to very uh, warmly thank you on behalf of our team, of our volunteers, of our, uh, obviously everybody who is uh, listening today, our audience, Phyllis, uh, you have been magnificent. Uh, as usual, Annick Lapointe aussi, tu as fait un travail magistral, un énorme merci mon ami, and um, we hope to see you on, on our next events, and uh, so thank you again for, for everything, merci tout le monde, et à très bientôt.